everybody. <clears throat> it's great to see so many of you here for, um, for a message that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, every, time, every time Annie and I get to go out and go on the road and um, do music with this band that we've been with for the last 30-ish years, there's always an evangelist on the platform. There's always the gospel preached, there's always an invitation given. And so we get to see firsthand the impact that the gospel message has in people's lives as they respond to it. So um, this is a real, um, it's a treat for me, it's a joy for me to get to talk about it. When Kirk and Dale and I sat down probably six weeks ago or something like that, we were talking about what are the foundations of our faith. Let's identify them. And as we whittled this list down a bit, <clears throat> and Kirk uh, asked the question, do you guys want to want to teach some Sunday? I very rudely jumped in and said, yes, I would love to teach the gospel before anybody else got a chance to say, yes, I want to do that. <clears throat> All right. So, and Thanks to Dale and Kirk for being very gracious and saying, yeah, okay, that's, that's great. So, um, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. <clears throat> about the middle of last week, do you remember when the tornadoes went through the state of Tennessee? Um, I saw an interview with a woman who had just lost everything in this storm that swept through. And I don't think she was a Christian. Um, she was not just devastated, she was completely hopeless. That's the way she acted. And she said two phrases to the man who interviewed her. She said, I just feel like life does not add up right now. She also said, life doesn't make any sense to me right now. Completely understandable, especially if she didn't have the hope of heaven. And I, those, those two phrases made my ears perk up because um, as, a, as an 18-year-old going off to college, I felt exactly like that. Life didn't make sense and nothing added up. <laughs> Espe especially my wardrobe choices, apparently. <laughs> wow. Look at that handsome devil. Cut, cut me some slack, it was the 70s, and it was, it was actually cool to wear a turtleneck with a collared shirt. Don't laugh, it was. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> but I just, as an 18-year-old going off to college, I just felt like, um, I just felt disoriented most of the time. I felt weightless, not in a good way. I, in other words, unanchored as a person. And I just felt like there had to be one piece of information, just something that I was missing that would make life make sense. Enter the next guy on the slide, <clears throat> that handsome devil in the upper, upper left-hand corner, Kenneth McMillan. Um, he, I don't even know how to describe him to you guys. He was a whirling dervish of a guy. He was a man on a mission. He made it his mission in life to tell anyone and everyone about Jesus. And when I, when I got down to college, we were, we were in the same dorm. He became a good friend. Um, we, we roomed together for a year. But at the beginning, I had no idea what to make of this guy because he, he talked about Jesus all the time. And I, was, I grew up in Connecticut, I was a Connecticut Yankee coming down to South Georgia. I went to Georgia Southern University to go to college. And I just thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe everybody down here talks about God. We're in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Everybody's a Baptist. So I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's why he talked about Jesus all the time. But come to find out, no, not everybody talks about God. It was just Kenneth. And he would, <clears throat> first time I ever met him, he said, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, you know, 
not very confident, but yeah. Um, and I figured I was a Christian by process of elimination. I wasn't this, I wasn't that, I wasn't Jewish, God bless you. I wasn't um, Muslim, I, I'm a Christian. And he started into this message called the gospel that we're going to talk about this morning. And um, at first I was polite and I listened nicely and <clears throat> as time went on, um, I got less polite. There were, there were times when he would literally just barge through the door of my dorm room, wouldn't even knock, just barge through, sit down on the bed and start talking about Jesus. And I would, <clears throat> after a while, I would cuss him out and then kick him out, but he would always come back. He would, he would I mean, he just, and he did it not just to me, but to all the guys in this dorm. <clears throat> um, to make a very long story short, um, uh, January 14th, 1974, uh, room 309, Brandon Hall, Georgia Southern University, I, I committed my life to Christ because <clears throat> when he first started telling me this message, I, I started to feel like, I wonder if this is the missing piece for me. I wonder if this is the thing that's going to make life make sense for me. <clears throat> and it did, and it does, and it will for anybody. Um, that, that message that Kenneth shared with me um, has always been... The, the, God's plan for his creation, for created things and created people has always included his plan of redemption, of rescue. And so <clears throat> um, that plan is called the gospel, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about this morning. And my hope is this. If you know the gospel like you know the back of your own hand, and if you could communicate it to anybody, I hope you, I hope you hear something, either something new this morning or something old in a new way this morning, that'll make you want to go out and share it. And if you don't know the components of the gospel, if you don't know the, the headlines that make up the good news, that you'll want to study it, and you'll want to put it into your own words so that you can communicate it to the people that are in your lives that need to hear it. Because every single one of us has somebody in our orbit that needs to hear this message. <clears throat> I've heard it communicated Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. I know you're tired of that number. I am, I am tired of saying it, but literally thousands of times over the years. And I'm just so grateful that the number of times I've heard it communicated has not bred contempt. You know, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes. The number of, the number of times that I've heard it has bred a love for this message. I think, I think it's the most important message for any human being to hear. I think, it's, I think it's the purest expression of the love of God in all of Scripture. The, the entire Old Testament points forward to it. The entire New Testament is based on it. Our lives are supposed to be lived in the light of it. And it's not just for us. Because once we respond to the gospel, we're supposed to be a conduit of this message to other people. So let's take a look at it. What is, what is it? What is the gospel? <clears throat> um, the word gospel comes from a Greek word, euangelion. Dale and Kirk, you can correct my pronunciation later. Euangelion, when, when the gospel writers used this word, it was a very, they were using a very common very non-religious word from their culture. And almost always it had political connotations. <clears throat> when a new Caesar was going to be installed in Rome, there was a good news. There was a euangelion associated with his rule. And it was used, usually used to announce, hey, good news, there's going to be a new Caesar. And if you come under his rule, and if you're a good citizen of his kingdom, 
there's going to be benefits to you for being a citizen of his kingdom. So when, when Peter or Paul preached in the book of Acts and they used this word, good news, their hearers probably heard something like, this, this Jesus, he's the king of kings. And he's going to set up his kingdom and he's your Messiah. He's your deliverer if you want him to be. And there's all these benefits of living in his kingdom. And thousands of years later, there's still all these benefits to you and me if we're willing to come under his rule and live in, live in his kingdom. <clears throat> think, of, think of the good news for a minute like a newspaper, like a, literally a paper newspaper that's delivered to your driveway or a, or a news website that you go on to read news, one that doesn't have fake news. <clears throat> Who's, whose name do you think is on the byline of the story? Who's the author of the good news? Man, A students in here. For years, I operated uh, under, the, under the idea that, well, first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the Gospels. So Matthew is the author of the gospel in the book of Matthew, and then Mark and Luke and John. <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the title page of any one of the gospels in your Bible, you'll see that it doesn't say the gospel of Matthew. It says the gospel according to Matthew, or according to Mark or Luke or John. Turn to Romans uh, chapter 1 for a minute. We're going to read um, Romans 1, 1 through 3. Paul says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. So it's the gospel of God concerning his Son. Why does that make a difference? I just think it's important to remember at the beginning that this good news, this message, does not have a human origin. It's God's idea, and it's his message about his son. <clears throat> not only did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have their version of God's message, but you and me, as we live our lives in word, and indeed, we're communicating our own version of this message to people. And this, this morning, millions and millions and millions of people around the world who have trusted Jesus and are following him, they're communicating their version of the gospel to the people in their world. But it's God's gospel about his son. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the components that make up the good news. Unfortunately, in order to understand how really amazing the good news is, we have to understand how devastatingly bad the bad news is. <clears throat> remember, remember the original lie uh, that the serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden? <clears throat> I, can't, I, can't think about, I can't think about that scene um, without thinking about the Harry Potter movies. Any, any Harry Potter nerds in here? A couple, yeah, thank you for being honest. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to expose my nerdship right now. <clears throat> Remember in those couple, uh, couple of movies where Harry spoke to the snake in parcel tongue, the language that allowed them to communicate? I just, I just always picture this scene happening with the snake hissing, like in the movies, hissing his temptation to Adam and Eve. You remember what the temptation was? Disobey God in this one thing. Just this, just this one time, act independently from him, and you can be like God, and you won't need him. And I think as human beings, we've been trying to be our own gods and act like we don't need him ever since. <clears throat> And look at the mess we're in. Let's, let's, let's take a look at what the mess looks like. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3.23 says very simply, all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. <clears throat> Sin's kind of an uncomfortable word, right? I, I've been to churches where even pastors would avoid the word. <clears throat> the Bible defines sin as rebellion against God and transgression of his law. Sin starts in the heart. Sin is a heart that rebels against God and says, I don't want you to be God, I want to be God. And then that life is lived out through sinful actions. <clears throat> so go back to Romans 3.23. How many have sinned? All. Oh. One out of every one person's sins. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female or devout or agnostic or atheist or Trump voter or Biden voter. You can decide amongst yourselves which is a bigger sin, voting for Trump or Biden. <laughs> but it, it just doesn't matter... Um, the color of your skin, the country you're born in, the language you speak, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're born into it, the Bible says. Theologians call it imputed sin. The sin of Adam and Eve was passed down and imputed into us. It's in our, it's in our spiritual DNA. We're born into it, and we tend toward it. It starts with a little Rebellion in the heart that says, I don't want anybody, including God, telling me how to live my life. I want to live my life my way. And attitudes produce actions, and sinful attitudes produce <coughs> sinful actions. And we wind up disobeying his instructions. Let's ask, let's ask this question. Why does God get to instruct us in the first place? Why does he get to determine what's sinful and what's not? <clears throat> Remember a couple weeks ago when Dale spoke about um, evidence from science, from nature, from scripture about God as creator? <clears throat> and by the way, I, I, I'm going to pause for a minute. Dale um, sent me something that I think would be a great tool for all of us as we share the gospel with the people in our lives, there's a handout on the table back there. Some helpful questions to ask people to get spiritual conversations started and elements that compose the components of the gospel. So pick up, pick up one of those sheets of paper on the table on your way out. Thank you, Dale. So why does, why does God get to determine what's right and wrong for me? <clears throat> If God is creator, if he's the manufacturer of me and you, then he, the manufacturer gets to write the instructions. And that's not a bad thing. That's a really, it's a really good thing for me and for you. I don't want, if God is the manufacturer, I don't want somebody who didn't have a hand in my manufacture telling me how to live life. And I think we have off-base ideas about God's instructions because sometimes we have an inaccurate picture of who he is, of what he's like. He is not... Oh, what a handsome devil. <clears throat> he's not that guy. He's not the uh, angry rule maker anxiously waiting for us to disobey so that he can punish us when we draw outside the lines. I think it's, I think it's more accurate to think of God's instructions as guardrails for life. And <clears throat> God is not so rigid on certain things that there's not room within the guardrails to navigate. Um, guardrails are a good thing. They, they keep us from going over a dangerous embankment and hurting ourselves. <clears throat> if we stay within those guardrails, we flourish as human beings. <clears throat> We're safe from consequences that we might suffer if we went over the side. Okay, so all have sinned. What, what, what are some of the consequences of our sin? Turn over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says this. The Lord's hand is not shortened, 
that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. There is nothing wrong with God's ability to save. He wants to. There's nothing wrong with his hearing. He wants to hear from us. But the Bible says that our sins have thrown up a wall of separation between us. It's our doing, and so that he can't save, and so that he can't hear. <clears throat> sin is a separator, the Bible says. If we sin against people, if we sin against each other, we're not going to want to be with each other. If we sin against God, we don't want to be with him, mainly because of the guilt that we innately feel, and a wall of separation goes up. <clears throat> okay. Here's a little more bad news before we turn the corner to the good news. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Paul writes this, The wages of sin is death. What our sin earns us is death. <clears throat> Some people live their entire lives with sin as their boss. Sin can be a pretty good boss at times. can he? It's, it's kind of fun, it's kind of pleasurable to work for sin for a season. There's some short-term benefits to having sin as your boss. But if, if I live my whole life allowing sin to be my boss, then death is going to be my pension, the Bible says. That's, that's what it earns me. And if I spend my entire life constantly pushing him away, and make no mistake, I'm going to have to keep pushing him away because he loves us too much not to pursue us. But if I spend my entire life pushing him away, then I'm going to have to spend my eternity without him because that was my choice here. Amen. The Bible says it's appointed to people to die once and after this comes judgment. So our choice for eternity starts here. <clears throat> But there's a free gift, and even, even as I say that, it, it sounds too easy, doesn't it? I mean, you mean, I'm a sinner, and I'm separated from God, and my sin earns me death, but he's just going to give me a gift? He's just going to give me a gift, a get-out-of-jail-free card? Yeah, kind of. He is. He's offering to pay my debt, and he's offering his son to make the payment. And it's free to you and me, but it was not free to God because it cost him the life of his son. Imagine how much God must love you and me if he offers us the solution to our sin problem through his son. <clears throat> I love you guys, but there is no way in the world I would offer you the, sol the solution to your sin problem through my son. I love him too much. Um, you're on your own. Sorry. I mean, what, what kind of love is that? Listen, listen to what John wrote. Here's, here's, here's what kind of love it is. 1 John 4.10. In this is love, John says. Here's what love looks like. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's kind of a $10 word. It just means simply this, to offer a sacrifice that appeases God's just judgment against sin and sinners. And God sent Jesus to be that sacrifice. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. So that gift was purchased for us 2,000 years ago, and it's been sitting there waiting for anybody who wanted to pick it up, receive it, and say, yes, I want that, it's mine. Amen. <clears throat> Here's some more good news. John 10, 18, <clears throat> John writes this. No one takes my life from me. This is Jesus talking. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking of Jesus as a victim, as if something happened to him that was somehow outside of his control. Jesus didn't go to the cross because Judas betrayed him. 
Judas did betray him, but that's not why he went to the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross because the Romans and the Jews were cruel. They were. But that's not why he went to the cross. He went to the cross because we had, we had this huge sin problem that couldn't be solved any other way other than by a perfect sacrifice, which Jesus made. <clears throat> but it's only a perfect sacrifice if God himself makes it. That's the only way it could possibly be effective for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Listen to what, first Peter, uh, what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.18. Peter said, Christ died once for all, the just, that's him, for the unjust, you and me, in order to bring us to God. Then he goes on, being put to death in the flesh, that's the sacrifice we just talked about, but being made alive in the spirit. And that refers to his resurrection. And that's why any communication of the gospel, if you read Paul's sermons in Acts or Peter's or Stephen's, the, the resurrection is always emphasized. Because <clears throat> it's only a perfect sacrifice if the one who sacrificed stays dead. I'm sorry, doesn't stay dead. <laughs> Let me say that again. It's only a perfect sacrifice if the one who is sacrificed doesn't stay dead. Turn to Matthew 16, 21. <clears throat> Jesus predicted his death, burial, and resurrection multiple times in the New Testament. Here's one of them, Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. The gospel is only good news if Jesus proves himself to be God by rising from the dead. If Jesus is less than God, the, the gospel is just information about a famous dead teacher. That's all it is. John wrote in John 3.16, probably the most famous, even in the culture, uh, book and verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, we'll come back to that word in a minute, whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. <clears throat> when, when that word is translated into English, believe, it's the Greek word pistevan. And in English, we can use the word believe in such a weak way, right? We could, we could say... Yeah, I believe that. So what? Whatever. There's no so what and whatever in this Greek word pistevan. When, when John writes believing in Jesus, he's saying have confidence in. Be utterly convinced that he is who he says he is. Put your confidence and your trust in the object of your faith, which is Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus. And it carries, that word carries so much weight with it. That if I believe in Jesus, if, if I pistevan in Jesus that way, it's going to affect the way I act. It's going to affect the way I talk. It's going to have implications right down to my lifestyle. <clears throat> okay, let's do a quick recap. Every single one of us is a sinner in attitude and in action. Sin separates me from God. The wages of sin, what my sin earns me, is death. But God loves us so much that he's going to provide the remedy. And that remedy is the sacrifice of his only son in our place. God punished Jesus for my sin, for your sin, so that we wouldn't, literally, we would not have to be punished if we don't want to be. And Jesus volunteered for the punishment. He was not a victim. <clears throat> Turn to Isaiah 53. Here's what the prophet wrote 700 years before Jesus was even born. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. That's kind of the, kind of the Old Testament version of Romans 3.23, isn't it? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. 
We've turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And Jesus said, it's finished, and he breathed his last. But because it's good news, that's not the end of the story. Because Jesus proved himself to be God by rising from the dead. <clears throat> it sounds like, <laughs> I mean, if you think about the arc of the story and how huge it is, it sounds like a, a super superhero story from the Marvel Universe, doesn't it? I mean, it's so outlandish, so revolutionary, I think, that if it's true, that kind of a message demands a response from you and me. If, it, if it's true, it requires that we respond to it. Because if it's true, I get a brand new start. I get a, I get a do-over. I, I can become a, literally a new person. If it's true, I get Jesus as my king. If it's true, I get a whole new family. If it's true, I get a room full of brothers and sisters who want what's best for me, who pray for me, who help me navigate life, uh, who literally will encourage me or admonish me if I need it. That's really good news. If it's true, I get the creator of the universe as my dad, as my heavenly father. Amen. And he loves us so much that he will always welcome us home just like the prodigal son discovered. And that's where we're going to go and that's where we're going to end. <clears throat> Turn to Luke chapter 15 as you're doing that. Here's, some, here's just a little bit of background. <clears throat> Jesus had been hanging out with some sketchy people. Duh. Where else was he going to be? He said, I didn't, I didn't come for those of you that think you're doing okay on your own. I came for the sick. I'm the great physician. Where else is he going to be? He's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And the uber-religious crowd, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're observing Jesus and they're grumbling amongst themselves. And they're denigrating him. And they're saying, what is the matter with him? Look who he's hanging out with. And Jesus knows that they're grumbling and knows what they're grumbling about. And so Jesus tells three stories, three parables. Parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin, and he tells this story known as the parable of the prodigal son. <clears throat> Let's read it together. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that's coming to me. Let's stop there. <clears throat> Does that sound like an entitled brat to you? <laughs> I just cannot believe the height of his entitlement. He doesn't ask a question. He says, Father, give me what's coming to me when you die. He's talking about his inheritance. He's basically saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine. And then inexplicably, the father does it. It makes me shake my head. <laughs> and so the father divided his property between them. <clears throat> Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far country. He didn't go down the street. He probably went as far away as he could. He wanted to get out from underneath his dad's thumb. He wanted to get out from underneath his dad's rules and his dad's authority. And so he went a long way away, and the story says that he squandered <clears throat> everything, squandered his property in reckless living. Later in the story, we learn that he squandered his money on prostitutes. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. <laughs> that just makes, just makes me crack up. The Jews, the Jews' favorite pet, right? Pigs. Not very kosher. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. 
he, I would say he hit his rock bottom. Wherever rock bottom was for him, he had hit there. He was with the pigs, and the pig slop started to look good to him. <clears throat> I love this next phrase, verse 17. If you have a print Bible, underline this next phrase. Don't take a Sharpie to your phone screen. but I love this. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? but I perish here with hunger. So he starts, he comes to himself, and he starts this inner monologue with himself. But I perish here with hunger. And then, if you're an underliner, underline this next phrase too, I will arise and go to my father. He continues the inner monologue, and he rehearses a conversation that he's going to have with his dad. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. You think that's just coincidence? That on the day the kid chose to come home, the dad happened to be on the road? I don't think so. The kid went a long way away. Maybe if the kid had moved into an apartment in the same town, the dad might have done that. But the kid moved into a far country. I think the dad loved his son so much that he went out to the road and he waited every day. He came to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son started to to tell him what he had rehearsed. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father cut him off. The father said to him, or father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Those, those two phrases that I asked you to underline, when he came to himself, and I will arise and go to my father. That is the, the right, the perfect, the intended response for you and me to the gospel. First, he, he came to himself. He saw himself clearly. He took, a, he took a good look in the mirror. He saw his own rebellion. He saw his situation, how dire his situation was. He saw that it wasn't his dad's fault, that it was his fault. That's what I would call the first inning in the game of repentance. Repentance is not a game. That's probably a poor way to put it. It's, it's the first inning. It's the start of repentance. He came to himself. He saw himself clearly. He started to have a change of heart and a change of mind. And then having seen clearly, he made a decision. He acted. He got up and he went to his father. And our actions complete the picture of repentance, of what repentance is. <clears throat> repentance is at its, at its core a military term. I'm walking one way. I'm just going through life. And I stop and I see myself clearly and I come back to myself, and my heart and my mind start to change. And that causes an action, it's an about face, and you head the other direction. Repentance is a change of heart, and it's a change of direction. And one is not complete without the other. I'm going to ask the band to come up. What, What made the prodigal son's change possible? He had a father who loved him. The Bible says that God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He loved so much that he gave. And that's what makes it possible for us to come to repentance. And I think think it would be wrong and very remiss of me to talk about how good the good news is without giving 
all of us a chance to come to ourselves and to repent. Now, I know most of your faces. I know something about most of your lives, but I don't don't recognize every face. So I'm going to ask you to do something hard. Every time Jesus invited people to do something difficult, he was inviting them into a greater intimacy with him. He wasn't wasn't challenging them to do something difficult because he likes to make our lives hard. He was inviting people into intimacy with him. So I just want to ask you this morning, if if you've heard the message and you feel like, I'm, I'm seeing myself clearly and I really need I really need a new start. I need a do-over. I want to repent and I want to follow Jesus. I just want to ask you to raise your hand. Anybody? I know it's hard. I know, but every time Jesus invited people to follow him, he invited them to do it publicly. So anybody want to make it public this morning? Raise your hand and say, I'm... I need to follow Jesus. I've never done this before. I need to follow Jesus. Was that a hand? Thank you for your courage. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Keep your hand up. Okay. I'm going to ask those of you that raised your hands to stand up. Can we give them a hand? Thank you for your courage. You can stay standing. Sorry. I'm going to I'm going to lead you in a very very simple short prayer. And the word the specific words not important at all. It's the attitude of the heart expressing ourselves to God. So I'm just going to ask you to pray out loud after me. God, I am tired of living my life for myself. I can't do it anymore. And I am so grateful for the good news that you want me to follow you. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Now, whether you feel different or not, Jesus came into your life, and you are a new person. Sorry. This happens every time I see people do this. You know what? I think what we need to do is just... um, Let's, let's bring the service to a close. The three of you guys that stood up, I'd love, as soon as, as, soon as uh, everybody kind of makes their way out, I'd love for you to come forward. We would just love to have a short conversation with you, answer questions, and assure you of the decision you've made, okay? So I want to invite everybody else. You guys can um, continue your conversations outside and celebrate what's going on inside. Amen.